Hello, my name is Chris Reich, and thank you for joining us. In today's webinar, we'll be sharing helpful information on switching from other solvers to the Groby solver. Our first presenter today is Dr. Renan Garcia. He is an optimization support engineer here at Groby Optimization. He has a PhD in industrial and systems engineering from Georgia Tech, is an expert in optimization modeling and software development, and has over a decade of experience implementing decision support systems. Our second presenter today is Dr. David Nimi. Dr. Nimi is a principal consultant at Abramod. He has 20 years of software development experience, 15 years experience implementing CPLEX and Garobi models, received his PhD in operations research from the University of Texas. And if you've ever asked a question about CPLEX or Garobi on Stack Overflow, he may well have been one of the people to have answered it. With that, Thank you again for joining us today, and we'll begin in just a moment as I switch control to Dr. Garcia. Okay, uh, before we dive in, I'd like to present a brief overview of what we'll be covering today. I'll begin by highlighting some of the tools and resources provided by Groby, which facilitate switching. Next, I'll review some common migration scenarios and strategies. Then I'll turn it over to Dr. Nimi, and he'll take you through two in-depth examples, the first of which involves migrating from a modeling language, namely OPL. Uh, the second is relevant to those using the CPLEX Concert API. But keep in mind, though, that the concepts used in his approaches should be applicable to other languages and solvers. Finally, Dr. Nemi will close with some general advice for a successful migration, given his expertise in this area. So Gurobi Optimizer is a state-of-the-art math programming solver. And naturally, potential users who are looking for top-end performance ask us all the time about how easy it is to switch from their existing solver. Switching can seem daunting, but it's typically straightforward for those who are already familiar with a solver or a modeling language. When we get feedback, it's often that the, the code migration process was surprisingly easy, and some of these folks even accomplish this on the order of hours, not days. Before you decide on how you'll interface with Garobi, you'll need to consider some key issues when starting a migration effort. Of course, you'll want to determine how you're currently building your models. Are you writing them to files? Are you creating them in memory? Do you build them one constraint or variable at a time? Or you, do you define the entire constraint matrix in one shot? Uh, you'll also want to consider the, the parameters you're setting for your current solver. Some settings, like termination criteria, carry over naturally. But some algorithmic settings that are best for your existing solvers aren't necessarily the best for Garobi. And finally, how you compute and extract your solution is also critical. Do you need them exported to text files and databases, or are you, they used in memory in the context of an application? The good news is Gurobi lets you work in multiple environments, some of which should be better suited for your particular situation. Gurobi is distributed with standalone tools, such as the command line interface or the interactive shell, but you can choose to work with your favorite programming language and embed Gurobi within applications. We have popular matrix-based APIs, such as C, MATLAB, and R, and object-oriented APIs like C++, Java, .NET, and Python. All of these are lightweight and similar in structure to those provided by other optimization engines, which facilitates migration. You might also choose to work with a host of third-party solver-independent modeling systems that support Garobi. And there's many of these available in both the commercial and the open source space. So with so many choices, you're likely to find a suitable migration option. So many of our users were able to migrate on their own using resources available on the website. There's a specific section on that site that provides switching guidance. There's extensive documentation for getting familiar with the Groby interfaces. This includes quick start guides for getting up and running in each of the major platforms. There's detailed reference manuals for each of the APIs. There's sections on parameters and attributes, which are important concepts we'll cover in a bit. There's a tour of functional examples designed to illustrate the use of particular interface features. And most of these are provided for multiple APIs. And there are seminars and videos on particular topics like modeling and tuning. And this webinar itself will actually be added to that library. OK, so let's move on to some common migration scenarios. Let's talk about those. The first scenario I'll cover involves model files. For example, this is particularly useful during performance testing. You may be looking to see how well Garobi performs on your particular models before migrating. Unfortunately, this is possible with almost no changes to your code. Most solvers have an export feature that writes models to common model file mar formats, such as MPS or LP, and Garobi supports these. 
In fact, there's guidance on the website on how to do this for many of the popular solvers. And once you have the model files, you can then run them with the Groby command line tool. And you see there how to use it. You essentially call the Groby underscore CL command at a terminal or a Windows command prompt. You give it a list of parameters and then a file name. Right? So in the example shown there, I'm solving a model called MISC07 with a time limit of an hour since the uh, units are in seconds. So this is essentially a quick and dirty approach with limited ability, ability to uh, interact with the solver. You, know, you can only interact through parameters, but it's very effective for evaluations. And if you need more control for advanced testing, like manually ins inspecting portions of the solution or modifying the problem, try the interactive shell. So I mentioned the Groby parameters, which are primary means of controlling the algorithms. So if you go through the corresponding section of the reference manual, you'll see there's many parameters similar to those that you're used to with your current solver. And here I've highlighted a few of them. So there's parameters related to termin termination criteria. You can, for example, set a time limit, how long the solver will run. You can set tolerances. MIP gap is how you set the tolerance for discrete problems, essentially the optimality gap uh, between the continuous relaxation and the best feasible solution. There's parameters for continuous algorithms, like method, that allows you to choose what algorithm you're going to solve uh, for uh, linear and quadratic problems. There's parameters for discrete models like MIP focus, which allows you to put different emphasis on the algorithm in, in terms of either finding good feasible solutions or improving the, the best bound solution, right? There's also a parameter called cuts, which allows you to turn up the aggressiveness or turn down the aggressiveness on cutting planes added during the branching cut. And then there's general parameters such as pre-solve, which controls how aggressive you know, your initial reformulation is to create a smaller model or tighten the uh, relaxation. So at this point, I'd like to caution that even though there's a natural mapping between some of these parameters to those of your existing solver, the settings you're currently using don't necessarily transfer over. And this is because the solvers use different algorithms. So if anything, with Groby, less is more. And these default settings have been carefully chosen by running the algorithm on thousands of models in our internal bench set. And the only way to know for sure which parameters improve performance is to try them out with your models. Don't just assume your current parameters are good ones. So in scenario two, we'll talk a little bit about modeling systems. For example, you may have a model written in AMPL. The key distinction here is whether or not your modeling system is solver independent. If it is, then switching is extremely easy. So once you've obtained a, a Gurobi license, all you need to do is set the solver option to Gurobi and convert your parameter settings. You typically do this through your system's IDE, through the command line, or by modifying a script file. And here I've shown a, a simple example of how to do this in AMPL with just two lines of code added to the model file. So in the first line, I changed the solver to Groby by adding the solver Groby AMPL option. And in the second line, I give a list of Groby parameters, in this case, MIP focus equals one, to have the solver focus on finding good feasible solutions. And all you need to do after that is run. So the other case is if your solver is, is not solver independent, such as OPL or Moselle. In those cases, you'll need to migrate your existing code. But the good news is, since both of these are algebraic modeling languages, this migration tends to be more straightforward than porting from a programming language. One option is to port to another solver independent modeling system like AMPL, but we also encourage you to take a look at the Groby Python environment as an alternative to modeling systems. In that environment, we've taken high-level optimization modeling constructs and embedded them into the Python programming language. And the goal there was to bring the feel of a modeling language to the Python interface with natural syntax. Uh, you don't need to know much programming to get started. However, the nice thing is it allows you to extend the model code if you're looking for more flexibility and power, since Python supports all your programming needs. For example, you may be interested in deploying that model down the road and integrating it into an application, or you may be interested in augmenting it with callbacks. Uh, there's many different scenarios where it might be more advantageous to get more power. So Python is a terrific option in this case, and there's several seminars covering this topic on our website, and Dr. Neiman will actually go through an example of this later in the webinar. I'd also like to mention the set of interactive examples on the website. So these are nice because they take you all the way through the model building in Python, all the way from the mathematical formulation to the implementation itself. And so in this scenario, given you'd already have an algebraic representation of your model, 
if you were using a modeling system, you know, the workflow should be similar. So uh, we encourage you to take a look. They're actually pretty fun to play with because they're interactive and you can submit your own problem instances. Okay, the third scenario involves matrix-oriented code. For example, you may have a C program which calls Cplex or Express. In this case, not to worry, Groby's API supports sparse matrix format, which is the standard format used by many solvers. In this format, you know, you have simple arrays representing matrix coefficients and their index positions. Groby supports compressed sparse row format with the grb add consters function and sparse column format with the grb add vars function. Groby also supports advanced features like callbacks and advanced simplex routines in case you're interested in queries for things like Tableau rows. However, I'd like to highlight at this point some Groby specific modeling features you should keep in mind when porting existing code, namely Groby environments, lazy updates, and attributes. And I'll talk about each of those in turn next. So in Groby, models are built within Groby environments and then parameters are set on particular environments. So note that when a model is created at that point, they will get their own copy of the environment. Therefore, subsequent parameter changes to the parent environment are not reflected in the model's copy. So if you want to set parameters for the copy, you need to use the get end functions to query for that copy. So here's a simple example of setting parameters in C. I, in the first example, I set time limit of 3,600 seconds for the parent environment. You can see I'm just calling it on the E and V variable, uh, which is the global environment. And if I've already created a model, it shouldn't have taken effect for the model's copy. But in the second one, I call grb get env on the model to get its copy. And in that case, I am setting the pre-solve uh, parameter, in this case, to level two, which is aggressive. So this may seem a bit inconvenient, but it's actually very nice when you're working with multiple models, such as decomposition schemes, that you don't have to worry about maintaining a single set of parameters for both your master and sub problems. Um, so lazy updates is also an important concept. So when you're making calls to Groby, it queues up all these changes over multiple API calls and applies them in batches. And what this does is it makes model creation and updates more efficient. So after you include model elements, you must call grb model update function before you can use them in the model, or otherwise the change hasn't been applied. So for example, you should call this after creating a variable, but before using that variable in a constraint. And so this may require some changes to your existing code, but you know typically these changes are minimal since most users create models in phases, such as adding all the variables up front and then all constraints. And in that case, you'd only need to call update once, right after you uh, include all the variables. However, we recently introduced the update mode parameter, which allows you to use elements immediately without making any additional calls. But still a, uh, a good idea, though, to add model elements in phases, since this is the most efficient way to process them. As far as attributes, the final concept. So this is a unified system to access model elements and they work the same across all of our interfaces. And so there's uh, attributes associated with models, with variables, with constraints, and they each have their own relevant set. Uh, and you can find the full list available in the attributes section of the reference manual. To change these or access them, you uh, do this through a basic set of get and set functions where the attribute name is specified as a parameter. And this replaces many of the functions used by other solvers. You don't need to remember specific function names. Uh, you just need to re remember the type of thing that you're querying for. So here's an example of that happening in C. You use get set functions by type, so int double char and string. In the first one, I'm querying for the number of non-zeros in a model. I call the get int attribute since the number of non-zeros is an integer attribute, and I just store that in a non-zeros variable. I can do this also for variables. I can, for example, query the solution value, which is the x attribute, and give it an array. And I can also uh, set individual elements, like in the final example, I'm setting the right-hand side of a constraint to one. So the final scenario involves object-oriented code. Uh, for example, you might have a Java program which uses Cplex concert technology. Uh, the important thing to note here is Groby's OO APIs represent models 
uh, using objects, which is common for most solvers. There's objects for variables and constraints. Methods are used to create model elements. And here's a simple example where I'm adding a constraint to a model using two variable objects, x plus y, and saying the sum must be greater than or equal to 1. And what's nice is you can use algebraic notation here because there's operator overload. And so all these Groby APIs, the OO ones, are just thin layers on top of the same native C code. So naturally, you must consider the same Groby specific modeling features I mentioned in the, in the previous scenario when porting your code. Namely, you need to be careful with the environment and set things on the model environment. You need to call update on the model unless you have update mode equal to 1, and you call the gets and sets on the objects to change their attributes. So unlike the C interface, these OO ones typically require uh, more extensive changes because the solver interfaces aren't as similar. Uh, but you know, I'd like to caution you not to panic. Your code often looks similar. So here I've presented a, a simple example where I'm creating an empty model, adding variables and adding constraints in the Cplex concert API and also in the Gorobi uh, C++ API. And as you can see, it's, they're fairly similar. You create an environment, you create a model from that environment, you call add to introduce variables and add to introduce constraints. The two differences, obviously, as I mentioned before, you have to call update mode, so that way you don't have to worry about calling model update in this example. And one thing to note also, so in the concert API, you can actually have variables associated with multiple models. And that can be error prone, right? So there's not very many use cases where having the same variable associated with different models is useful, but it, it can actually lead to errors uh, at runtime. And Dr. Naomi will cover this scenario a little bit more in a bit, but I just wanted to mention that now. So as I turn it over to Dr. Naomi, I'd like to point out that there's guidance on the website specific to particular solvers and modeling languages and uh, we invite you to check that out. Thanks, Renan. So we have people interested in converting from Opal and from Concert and from quite a few other places, but we're going to dive into two disparate examples. First, moving from Opal and moving from iLog Concert. So what we have for Opal is, a, is actually a translation into Python, and we have for iLog Concert our adapters for the C-sharp, Java, and we're working on the C++ platforms. So please let us know, again, if you're interested in any of these or if you have success or, or difficulty with any of them. So we're going to discuss some general advice on migrating. So switching to Garobi, there are a couple hurdles that maybe people perceive. One is that you have a large code base. The other is that you may have business logic embedded in your API calls. So what happens inevitably when you're building an uh, optimization model? business logic migrates into the API calls and they're sometimes difficult to uh, translate out into other things. But some mitigating factors for you to think about, the time to migrate is not necessarily proportional to the size of the code base. It doesn't necessarily have to grow. Just because you double the size of the code base doesn't mean that it needs to take twice as long to actually do the migration. And with MPS files, as Renan pointed out, you can see exactly how Garobi will perform on your specific models. And if you're counting on a performance boost, you can see if it's going to happen or not before you do much work. So before you start any migration or in any uh, large endeavor, it's a good idea to evaluate where you are currently. Are you actively adding new features to your model? Are you trying to add more features? Or are you mainly, mainly maintaining it? Just keep it going. And one of the big things is, do you have regression tests? If you're not familiar, what they are is a way for you to take a, a set of input instances and get a set of expected results at the end. In my experience, if you have these things, there's a matter if you're doing a migration or just doing development, makes the whole process much uh, more pleasant, gives you a lot more confidence in terms of ability to make changes to the model uh, and without fearing that you're going to break every time you make a little a small change, fearing that you're going to break things or break old behavior that you want to keep. So building a regression test set is a key part of, of a migration process or any, any kind of process. And of course, with an optimization model, there are specific challenges to creating regression tests, and uh, we can certainly help you with that, or uh, you can look at it, but they're not impossible. They're definitely, it's definitely possible to create good regression tests for an optimization model. So the second thing is the MPS files are your friend for evaluating the relative performance of two optimization models. 
But the LP file is also uh, your friend, not necessarily from evaluating the solver performance, but for evaluating how is your application building the uh, LP model that Groby is going to see. And to help you with that process, if you name all your variables and constraints, it's really nice to examine two LP files and see is the LP file that's being uh, created. So the model, effectively the model that gets sent to Groby, is it the same as the model that I'm sending to Cplex? This is a really handy feature. I always like to think of it as a test box out outside your house for your telephone. So you can kind of evaluate, is the, is the wiring in the house okay? And is the wiring out to the uh, telephone network okay? So let's talk about migrating from Opal. Opal is, includes a dom domain-specific language. It is locked to a solver. It's locked to the Cplex solver. So there's two main strategies you can try. You can move to one of the solver agnostic languages like AMPL, AIMS, GAMS, um, MPL, there are a few others. Those are kind of the, the most popular ones. Or what I'm going to suggest, which is migrating to Python. So why would we migrate from Python instead of going to one of the math programming languages? Well, in my opinion, Python gives you the best of both worlds. It's as powerful as a general purpose programming language, because it is a general purpose programming language, and it's as effective as a domain-specific language in modeling math programs, even though it's not specifically designed for math programming languages. I think if you look at the code, you'll see it's as concise and readable as, as an Opal model, and it's as learnable, Python is as learnable as Opal. And one of the benefits of that is that if you learn Python, you can use it for all sorts of things, not just math programming. So it's a side, side benefit. It's much easier to find people who can write Python code than it is to find people that write Polar Ample code. There's an interesting uh, Stack Overflow discussion that I had with one of the Ample developers on Stack Overflow. I encourage you to go look at that and see both viewpoints. Another thing about Python is it has a huge user base. It's huge. If you look at uh, Ample or Opal, if you look on Stack Overflow, maybe you have a few dozen questions, maybe a hundred questions. Python has almost a million questions uh, on Stack Overflow. It's got a huge user base, it keeps getting better every year, regardless of if any one vendor decides that they want to put effort into it or not. So looking at converting from Opal to Python, we look at some feature comparisons that a lot of the things that if, you, if you're familiar with Opal you really like, like tuples and sets, well Python has tuples and sets. Opal talks about you can read from Excel. Python has libraries that you can use to read from Excel pretty cleanly. Opal has the ability to read from uh, SQL databases. Python has a great library called SQL Alchemy. It's a great tool that lets you avoid a lot of writing a lot of SQL if you don't want to. It doesn't get any way at all from writing SQL if you do. It's not just an OR or object relational mapper. It's a great tool. It has a huge user base. There's O'Reilly books about it and everything. Opal has slicing and grouping. Python has the pandas library. It's, again, very large user base. There's also some built-in tools in, inside just the, uh, the base Groby library that you can use for, for doing slicing and grouping. Opal has, has a UI. Uh, now it's been migrated over to uh, a version of Eclipse. I think the current version does. Python has, besides the IDEs, Jeff, they have the Jupyter Notebook. There's also a great Groby webinar on using the Jupyter Notebook with Groby. Opal has the DAT format, which is a proprietary format for storing data, uh, for, for expressing data about specific problem instances. Python, it suggests you use uh, JSON, which is a standard format. It, it actually is fairly similar to the DAT format if you were to look at it in more depth. And Opal has something called Opal Script, which is sort of a uh, JavaScript implementation. Python has Python. This is one of the things I like the best about Python. It is a general purpose language. You don't need a separate language. You don't need two or three languages to do something. You just use Python to, to do anything that doesn't involve math programming models. And that's what I think is a key benefit of Python. You don't have a situation where you have two or three different languages to implement an application. You have one language. It reduces the amount of things that are on your technology stack. If you want to try Python yourself, and you don't already have Python installed, even if you do, maybe. The easy way, way to get started is with the Anaconda Python distribution from Continuum Ana Analytics. It's especially good if you're on Windows, because they build all the binaries for you. There's also instructions on how to install the Groby library with Anaconda on the Groby website. There's even a webinar on how to use Groby with Anaconda Python. It's definitely worth checking out if you missed it. The Opal code for this example is available on the NYU website. 
It's based on an example from the book Planning and Scheduling in Manufacturing and Services. The Opal code is available on the author's website. All the Python code I'm presenting here is available on GitHub, and you can use the code freely if you'd like, or just look at it. So in our approach, we're going to translate the, the DAT file to uh, JSON. JSON is a standard. Almost all programming languages have readers for JSON. Opal even reads it. It's a native format for a lot of applications, including a lot of NoSQL databases like MongoDB. Many applications have JSON exporters, so you may find out if you're writing, if you were actually generating DAT files, you may actually have to remove code to be able to generate uh, JSON because there's a lot more utilities. Even we had one client, there was just a simple couple line export to JSON from, from their application as opposed to a lot of custom code. So they wound up actually having to remove code to use JSON instead of DAT files. What we have actually is some Python scripts to translate most of the DAT files using the PyParsing library, which is another uh, Python library that is, comes with when you install Anaconda. That's another reason to use Anaconda rather than just going to python.org. And that parser is, uh, is available also on our GitHub. So let's look at the Opal and, and, Python and JSON side by side. And this is something that can be, again, translated just with a Python script. On the left, we have the Opal DAT file. And on the right, we have the equivalent JSON file. Almost all of it is, has, can be done with just regular expressions or even simple search and replace to, to replace the uh, delimiters, the, these kind of two-character delimiters that Opal has with the simpler delimiters that JSON has. There's also one small difference that there are no uh, commas in, in the arrays in Opal, but there are in JSON. But besides that, once you're using JSON, you're in a world that has a lot more tools and a lot more utilities that you can use freely. So life is actually going to be simpler. So Opal has data declarations. And in cases where you put a dot, 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 if you're, you're going to read from a data file later on, Python, what we, you can do almost the same thing. What we have is, and in, in, we'll see in the code, we have dictionaries. And you just specify a, a dictionary with the name of the uh, data element. In Opal, you can have arrays with multiple uh, indices. In Python, what we like to use is the pandas series object. And we'd have a little utility that you can just take from, a, from the JSON file and get a pandas series based on a set of uh, indices. Opal has ranges, so in, you can specify in the code. You can do the same thing in Python. Opal has a lot of ways to specify arrays of decision variables, and they can be either or scalars, they can be uh, multiple indices. In Python, we, we can do something I think is almost as clear or it, as clear. We just grab a, a get vars helper function, which takes the name of a variable and a set of indices and uh, create all the variables for you. And we, if you want to specify things to be uh, binary, you can just add that as a, as a variable type, which is the um, keyword argument for uh, Groby Python. In Opal, to express the uh, objective function, we have a series of sum clauses. In Python and Groby, what we do is we have a, a series of what are called Python list comprehensions. This gives you what I think is an intuitive and concise expression of each objective term. The constraints are handled similarly. Now, since Python is an Opal, is a domain-specific language, the constraint definitions have a little less ceremony. On the Python side, we have some, maybe we might call it clutter, if because we create a constraint and add it to the model, or as an Opal, we just create the constraints. So when you're pulling results from the solver, Opal has a, you can write expressions based on the decision variables, and if it's after the solve, you get the values rather than the variables themselves. In the Groby Python, you use as the attribute facility. So in Groby, the convention is that the x attribute is the value of a variable, not the variable itself. So in this case, to get the equivalent uh, sum above in, in the Opal example, the main difference is that you do a dot x to get the x attribute out of the variable. Other than that, it's pretty much the same amount of code. So to, to wrap up the Opal conversion section of this uh, webinar, I would say consider if you are going to migrate away from Opal, consider migrating towards Python. Uh, if you still like modeling languages, uh, Ample and GAMS are, are nice alternatives. 
but I think given the environment today, the way the state of technology today, Python is going to be the best uh, overall option for your application and for your business. So let's change the gears and talk about the Concert API for Cplex. Concert was originally a C++ API developed in the late 90s, and Java and C# -sharp versions followed in the early 2000s. At the time, it was a really great option for people who wanted to use mainstream programming languages but didn't want to use the matrix-oriented interface uh, of the C library. So migrating from Concert, you have two main strategies. One is to translate the code using some of the, uh, the pointers that Renan uh, mentioned earlier that are available on the Groby website, or you can use an adapter. The adapter is what we're going to discuss today. What we're going to actually do is technically an object adapter pattern for those who are um, pattern aficionados. So what is an adapter? Adapter is considered a design pattern. Technically what we're going to do is more of an object adapter pattern. You can see physical examples, of course, in, in everyday life. When, if you've ever gone and tried to use a, a plug in a country that has a different type of outlet, you use an adapter. The astronauts on Apollo 13 use an adapter so that when they ex inexplicably brought two incompatible carbon dioxide filters on their boarded trip to the moon, they made an adapter so they could use the CO2 filters on an uh, incompatible machine. So the point of the adapter approach is to give applications that are written against the Concert API access to the Groby solver, just like the uh, physical adapters give your uh, electrical devices access to the electric grid in another country. So the adapter we're going to show is not a complete implementation of Concert. It's just enough to make some models run. In fact, in our experience, most applications use a small subset of the overall Concert API. This adapter is free to use. You can use it as a starting point for your application. It's available on an MIT license. You don't have to share code or anything like that. You can if you want. You can use it as a starting point for your application, or you can just use it to look at how we did it and maybe do it better. So how do you use the adapter? You start from a working concert application. You remove the concert and Cplex libraries. You add the Groby library and add the adapter library and modify the adapter to work with your code, but maybe modify your code a little bit as well. So what you do is you take, if you have a make file, we remove all uh, mentions of the concert and Cplex API and add a ILO to GRB adapter. In Eclipse, you add the ILO GRB project as a dependency to your existing project. The adapter library is available, as we said, for, for Java and C Sharp. We're working on the C++. It's available on GitHub under a, a permissive MIT license. You can use it either in your application as a starting point for your application or just to get some ideas. So the adapter we have is an object adapter, not a class adapter. So this follows the principle of favoring composition over inheritance. So what we do is we'll have like the Cplex class and it will contain the Groby classes inside of it as, as members of the objects. And it may be tempting to try to make ILO Cplex subclass the GRB model, but what we found is that it looks like it may save you a little bit of, of effort, but in the long run it's not going to work. So what we've done and what we suggest you would do is to make the Groby objects members of the concert wrapper objects. So one C++ specific uh, comment, you know that the ILO objects are all actually handles. They follow what's actually the pimple algorithm. So that when you copy by value, you're actually copying by reference. So in C++ today, you can use the pimple algorithm together with the boost shared pointer to handle this exact functionality. In this case, what we've done for the ILO range object is actually have a implementation, which actually in a, not in the header, but in, in a CPP file, which actually contains all the details of the actual implementation. What happens here is if you do copy a range from one, one function to another, you're actually copying a reference, you're creating a new reference to the under, underlying implementation. So just a couple of comments and limitations about the adapter. Adapter probably will not work out of the box for your specific application. The idea is that you should consider it mainly as a starting point. A couple things that, that are semantically different about Garobi and Concert, one of the key ones is that variables are tied to models, not to the environment. So theoretically, in concert, a single variable can be part of multiple models. 
or it can be part of no model and, and sometimes you get something called a not extracted extractable not extracted or extractable cannot be extracted those sort of exceptions you may have to change your actual application so that you actually do create two, two sets of variables for each environment. There are also cases where models are extracted and put into other models. In those cases, the models are actually just used as containers, and that can be just they can be just stored in regular containers. Right now, we have limited support for callbacks and, and no support for goals, and probably not going to support goals. Perhaps if you have a particular callback that you want to try to port over or, or use, let us know, and we'll see if we can come up with a strategy for that. I guess we'll turn it over for uh, for questions. Thank you, gentlemen. So to get started, uh, the first question we have it involves Pyomo, and somebody asks, I'm familiar with Pyomo, which is a Python-based open source optimization modeling language, and if you are, can you compare it with the Gorobi Python interface? So yeah, I've, yeah of course, uh, we've heard of, of Pyomo. It's a nice package. I've actually I've used it. It's actually it's solver agnostic itself. It does use, I believe it still uses MPS files in between. So there's a little bit of a, uh, there'll be a little bit of a hit. So access to specific Groby specific things will be a little bit more difficult. It is something, if you look at the Python Groby Pi API and you still don't like it, that would be something to consider. I haven't used it a lot in production. I've used it a, co a couple times. They go say, there's also pulp. I know that one of their main goals is to explicitly make it look a lot like domain specific modeling language. All right, thank you. Um, so speaking of modeling, are there some things you cannot do in Python so that you would need C or C++ to be able to do those things in, in a Groovy program? Uh, I can take this one. So there's not really that many limitations, like you can use callbacks. The one thing is in Python, you typically have one global environment in your session. And one challenge there is Ruby environments and models aren't thread safe. So in some cases, you'd like to solve uh, models concurrently. But there's a workaround. You could just create a Python subprocess, and each one of those subprocesses can have their own environment, and you could do things concurrently. But otherwise, it's, it's fairly similar uh, amongst all the uh, OO APIs. I would say if your application is the type where you have a large amount of data, and you're solving, especially if you're solving an LP, where the, the actual data handling before you get to the solve is a significant part of the overall computation, then you might you may want to look at C++. NumPy, I mean, people, use, people are using with, with NumPy and Pandas, they're using, they are working with really large data sets. And uh, part of the point is you can, you can write your Python code, so it looks, it looks, it's still very concise and readable, but number of Python statements executed does not grow at, with the size of your problem. So you do the NumPy array operations, and you'll have one fixed amount of statements, really, of Python executed. But behind the scenes, there'll be a lot of operations executed in, in C. So that's something to, to consider if you want to use Python. But it depends on what, uh, what other things you're using inside your organization, what other languages. Thank you very much. Next question involves constraint programming. So what options are there for building applications that use Ilog constraint programming tools or other constraint programming tools? So there are a couple options for you there. It depends on how happy you are with the performance of that. If you're less than happy with it, you may want to consider moving to a MIP solver. If you wrote your CP code 10 years ago because it was, at the time, faster than what you could build with a MIP, the, well, the MIP solvers have gotten faster over time, probably at a faster rate than the CP solvers. There are also some other things, like actually some former iLog people are at Google, and they released their own CP product. It's, it's really available. It's accessible from, from Python as well. I've not used that yet, but if, if you really want to stick with a CP type model, you, you can do that as well. Of course, it depends on which, which situation you're in, but if, especially if you have an issue with performance, I would consider looking at what's the equivalent MIP formulation. Thank you. Um, how fast is the Python interface compared with the C or C++ interface? We don't have empirical data, but it, you know the C++ interface can be a bit faster if you're doing some heavy things. 
essentially both of these interfaces are just thin layers on top of the C code. So the only overhead would be in the model building process, but in actually, you know, in the model solving, it's all done with native C code. So there shouldn't be much uh, overhead. And in the end, it's it, you know, you need to use best practices. You need to call update as minimal as possible. And if you do those things well, it's usually about the same in performance. Although C++ can be uh, faster in some cases. All right, thank you, gentlemen. I think that is it for questions and, an uh, and answers today. I'll turn it over to Chris, who can uh, wrap up from today's presentation. Thank you, Dr. Glockner, Dr. Nimi, and Dr. Garcia. Appreciate everybody joining us today. Just with regards to next steps, there's a couple of things. One, if you don't already have a copy of Garobi, you're welcome to request a free evaluation license. If you um, also are interested, uh, David Nimi at Abramod would be happy to set up a meeting with you where he can give you a free consultation to take a look at your unique situation and, and maybe provide some perspective that'll be helpful to you. Uh, in addition, we'll be having webinar slides available in the next day or two, and the recording will be available next week. Uh, again, if your questions uh, weren't answered uh, during the session, we'll get back to you afterwards. And if you have any follow-up questions, please do feel free to contact us. So once again, thank you very much for joining today. And have a great rest of the day.